Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, President Joseph E. Ayun. Good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Great. So let me welcome you all. Where is our speaker? Does he have a seat, or he doesn't? He cannot have a seat. Why don't we let him uh, have a seat here? Colin, welcome. 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 Let me first uh, welcome you all one more time and tell you a little bit about uh, this uh, new innovation series that uh, we started here. The purpose uh, is to invite speakers uh, who uh, are really innovators, entrepreneurs, and who are doing it at the intersection of various fields because that's exactly what we are doing here, innovation, entrepreneurship at a global level and bringing together the, the fields to uh, uh, impact society. But there is one more dimension that uh, we are focusing on, as you know. It's the fact that whatever research we do, we want to see how it's going to benefit society and how it's going to impact uh, society. And that's what we call here translational or use-inspired research. And today we have a speaker who embodies uh, these values. Now let me tell you, he seems to be very shy because he's not used to speaking in public. In the last five days he spoke every day, he gave a public lecture. So uh, Colin, we welcome you here. You all read his uh, bio, you have it. So I will not dwell on that. It, suffice it to say that at the age of 22 he decided to launch his company and the rest is what you are going to discover today. But let me add one more thing, that we are extremely, extremely happy to work closely with uh, iRobots and with Colin because he had so far, they have uh, employed over 90 uh, of our students in various co-op opportunities. So we want to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, when I was talking with Colin, he told me that uh, his uh, purpose was to bring robots to have a practical uh, imp implication and impact. What he didn't tell me is that, in fact, his robots have feelings and that we have to treat them with care and a lot of TLC. And that's an experience that happened to me, and I want to share that with you, that you have done something remarkable, have robots with feelings. Let's watch that. Uh, I don't know whether you want to come next to me or, or be here and sit uh, near my wife and don't touch my uh, iPhone, please, or <laughs> iPad. <laughs> Are we going to, uh, am, I am I supposed to do it? Yes. Why don't you do it? You're better off than me. Hey, good morning, Ramba. What's going on? The room is not ready? You feel sad today? You tired? Listen, I have good news for you. Your creator will be here with us today. Do you want me to help you? I'll do it. I'll do it with you. <laughs> I have my broom. What? You don't want me to help you? I understand. You're much better at it. Go ahead. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I chose Rumba is that Colin told me that he's not going to focus on Rumba today, so we did it for him. Thank you. Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, now you've put that video on my laptop, I have it. <laughs> not saying where it will go next. So it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, have an opportunity to talk to you about the iRobot story. 
and a little bit about our adventure uh, in entrepreneurship, my adventure in entrepreneurship. And what I'm going to do today is, is tell you some stories. Hopefully we'll seed some questions and um, we will have an opportunity to answer those questions uh, after, after I'm, I'm, I'm through uh, up here. But uh, iRobot was founded in 1990. I've only had two jobs in my life, summer wilderness guide and CEO of iRobot. So it was, it was founded um, uh, right out of school based on a dream. And in my case, it, it was a robot dream. So <laughs> a lot of you recognize these two robots up here, R2-D2 and C-3PO. And I like to tell you that these are not the robots from Star Wars that inspired me to create a robot company and go into robots. It was something very different. Everyone know what that is? Yeah, the Death Star, right. And the stormtroopers on the Death Star had a problem. If you think about it, the Death Star was really new, right, when, when we all watched episode four. And on an aircraft carrier, there was 5,000 people, small city. The Death Star had to be millions of people in a really new place. How are the stormtroopers supposed to know what to do when the Rebel Alliance attacked? They needed help getting to where they needed to go. And so when I watched the movie Star Wars, this is a true story, I looked at R2-D2 and C-3PO, C-3PO and they seemed beyond what we could possibly hope to create. But this robot, MSE-6, I finally learned its name after 22 years, but this, this robot, MSE-6, its job was to lead the stormtroopers to the turbo lasers so that they could shoot down the Rebel Alliance. That's cool. <laughs> because I said, I know how to build that. That's a product that could actually exist. And that's why when I saw Star Wars, I didn't look at it from the perspective of androids. I looked at it from the perspective of what practical role could robots be playing in our lives. There are many dirty, ugly challenges that occupy our time that don't need to be done by people. We can think about empowering people to move around on their own instead of being pushed. We can think of robots to help our soldiers with the challenges that they face. Have the ability to take on some of the most dangerous work on the planet and pull the people back and push the robots forward. The idea is that there's a better way to do all of these tasks through the use of robots. And that germ of an idea led to iRobot, $400 million company in revenue last year. And this is cool. We've shipped over a billion and a half dollars worth of robots. And that's just unbelievably exciting to me because when we started shipping $10 of robots seemed incredibly exciting. So things change eventually, but it's been a journey. Uh, if you look at our revenue over time, uh, There you go, year seven, we have a pixel of revenue. <laughs> this, this is like a, a, a big deal for us. But um, we didn't give up, and we continued to f search and find ways to create opportunities. We certainly didn't succeed. Here's a list of 14 different failed business models that uh, during this particular time we, we, we attempted. Some over here is in addition. but. Uh, uh, I think that failure is part of entrepreneurship. Failure is part of proving to yourself that you're pushing the envelope and that you're learning and trying new things. And through all of this, all these challenging times, all of these different business models, we had another thing going for us, and that was a mission. iRobot, uh, I don't know how many companies truly can say, that their mission saved them, attracted their most important employees, and encouraged 
them to keep going. I can truly say that our mission did these things. Uh, I think we made it up maybe a year in to the company that goes like this. Build cool stuff, deliver a great product, have fun, make money, and change the world. That's it. This worked for us. Why? Because we were a company excited to build cool stuff. We were also a company excited not to be seduced just by building cool stuff, but the fact that we had to make robots that created real value in excess of the cost in order to survive. So being very explicit about making money in our mission statement was important to a geeky, high-tech robot company. And of course, changing the world was the thing where you lead up to and said, boom, we are ambitious. So even if our attempt to create robot video games failed, we said, well, are we having fun? Are we making enough money to survive? Have we changed the world yet? No, let's keep going. And I'd like to tell you some stories about how through taking some risks, asking ourselves, you know, either we're doing this or we're not doing this. And if we're doing this, then we should be able to impact the world in the following ways that we actually have had an impact and, and changed the world. Now, I said that I wasn't going to talk about Roomba. Usually when I have an opportunity to talk to entrepreneurs, my favorite thing is to tell this story. You guys are in for a, a little bit of a, an experiment tonight because I'm going to be talking about some other stories. But I will say that this robot uh, fits the, the, uh, the character. We created this robot. We put it out there. We have now sold over six million of these robots. And probably the most unbelievable statistic that I've heard in a few years uh, came to me uh, a couple months ago when my distributor in Spain said, Colin, I thought you might be interested. We just got some data back. And the data shows that one out of four vacuums sold in Spain is a robot. So I guess we've changed a little bit of something about how people think about vacuuming their floors. And uh, we're cutting down on the number of Luddites that still push upright vacuums. Hopefully all of you are far beyond that stage. If not, not uh, there's a solution here for you. So you can hold up your head in public and, and uh, <coughs> do other things. But in any case, um, let me tell you a story about iRobot's first business model. Space exploration. <coughs> in 1988, this is how NASA was going to explore other planets. They had built this rover. It was about the size of a Humvee. It moved half a centimeter per minute, and there did not exist a launch vehicle in the, on the planet that could lift this off the ground. And so at the time, uh, I was very excited about space travel. My professor was excited about space travel. And there was this kind of notion that we had, and I think this is a, a great expression. It goes like this. If we win, we win. That's it. How does it apply here? You could build that. You could harden it to operate flawlessly on Mars, and you would still lose because there's no way of getting it there. So why not adopt a radically different strategy to build a robot for space travel such that if you actually succeeded, you could, in fact, get it there. And so that was the idea. We were going to build this robot, send it to the moon, and fund the whole thing by selling the movie rights. That was our first business model. And the crazy thing wasn't that this was a harebrained scheme. I think we were the first company to fail at this particular business model. But we actually got incredibly far and had an impact. We built a robot called Grendel. That's this robot right here. We partnered with the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. That is the Star Wars guys under Reagan who are having funding challenges. And so we convinced them to take 
the ICBM seeker out of that robot, uh, out of that spacecraft, allow us to build a carbon fiber cocoon, put our robot in, and demonstrate it. Secure and ready for flight. Which we did. Vehicle pressure and temperature are nominal and holding. So this is out at Edwards Air Force Base at the end of a, I think, a 19-hour countdown. The robot is down here. Um, what you're going to see is the robot is going to launch, hover, translate, land, and eject the robot. Everything else in space travel is coasting. So energetically, this is doing most of the job. So we built that robot, we demonstrated that robot, JPL saw that robot, said BMDO, you can't do that, we can do that, took the technology, and as a result of that test, the Sojourner rover was added to the Measure Pathfinder mission. It was sent to Mars. Spirit and Opportunity were spent to Mars, and the era of micro spacecraft, micro rovers was born, and this now is how we explore other planets, something that we can feel very cool about, and we do. Afghanistan. Here's another story. Well, I mentioned that iRobot was founded to create practical robots, and at the time, robots were predominantly, if not exclusively, the property of either factories, in which case they didn't move, or research labs, in which case they didn't work at least not for more than a few hours at a time. We could actually build a robot that you could take outside and throw that would survive challenging environments was a radical notion at the time. This was what robots were all about. Technological marvels. These are amazing robots. They just happen to be useless outside of entertainment. And I mean that in the best of ways. If robots are going to create a business, then they have to create value. And maybe you can create an entertainment business with these robots. I don't know, but you can't solve the challenges that I was interested in. And so we built um, a different kind of robot with the goal of making it rugged, robust, and useful. So here's a robot, it's called PackBot. And we made this video to show sponsors, to show anyone who might give us money, that we could create something that could be thrown out of windows, that could drive up stairs, that could drive off the top of buildings, go through water. And this, at the time, was all incredibly new, challenging stuff. This is my favorite. Flips itself over. And as a result, people started to believe that maybe it was possible to create durable robots light enough to be carried, carry video systems on it. And then as a result, when this happened, this is ground zero, 9-11, we were allowed to bring our robots down. We were allowed to bring our robots and put them into the buildings around the rubble pile and go inside those buildings to ensure that they were structurally sound so we could look for survivors and start to remediate that situation. So we were there, we were probably one of the only uh, outfits that actually flew an airplane on September 12th because the whole skies were shut down, we got special permission, and we tried to go make a difference. Later, when we sent our soldiers over to Afghanistan, <coughs> we started hearing back on the news about the challenges that the soldiers were facing. These caves all over the countryside, which were being used as weapons caches, as hideouts, most frequently as village latrines 
for the Afghanis, at least the uh, terrorists in Afghanistan. And we thought to ourselves, wait, this isn't the way it should be. We shouldn't be still sending people into these caves on ropes. We have built that robot you just saw. And so we went down and we begged and we pleaded and we found an organization within the Pentagon who would allow us to go to Bagram Air Force Base, so assuming we were willing to put some of our employees through basic training to take the robots there. And we did. There's, this is the, um, uh, some footage uh, and some uh, commentary on, on what came out of that. The Rapid Equipping Force was that organization that got us there. The acquisition process is not conducive to the rapidity and the innovativeness of a fleeting enemy. So we have to have a system that is much more adaptable and within a couple of weeks have a technological answer that we can put in the hands of the soldier. I began my time in the Army during the Vietnam era. Our training at that time included tying ropes around soldiers so you can pull them out if they should get injured or killed. Whenever, whenever you basically walk into a cave, you know, you, you don't know what's in it. That's the biggest thing. You've got a big black hole. You don't know if it's booby trap, mine, what's in there, who might be in there. All the mortar rounds are stacked everywhere. One particular cave was about 30 feet straight up, and we reached the cave mouth. There was, I'd say, about a two-foot ledge. We shined a flashlight into the cave, literally hanging from our elbows. The 29th of May, we began the program. The 26th of June, we had put all the systems together. We were over here two days later on the 28th. Looking to try and see if we can provide some robots that might be able to help in some of the operational missions that you have, but also a whole system that comes together to give you the capability to do more things and more flexibly. These systems are actually supposed to be... So... This robot went down there. I'll tell you one story about that they didn't put in the video. Uh, when we showed up, the 101st Airborne was at Bagram Air Force Base, and they were tasked with this mission. Uh, they um, saw us. We did our demonstration for them. They said, incredible, awesome, where have you been? But we're shipping out tomorrow. So you're a little late for us, but the 82nd is coming in. And uh, so you'll have to demo for them. So the 82nd came in straight uh, out of training. They saw our demo and said, you know, this is cool, but we've been trained to clear caves. So hang out. Don't call us. We'll call you. Fine. That's what we did. We had no place to go. We're in the middle of Afghanistan. Um, <coughs> so we waited, and, and here's... Uh, Sergeant Petri and his, uh, his comrade here, who uh, went up to the first cave without the robots, looked at each other, said, you want to you go in? No. You, I don't. Let's call the robot guys. And <laughs> so the cave mouth epiphany happened. We became, we came there. We had great, amazing partnering with the 82nd. <laughs> here he is happy and, and smiley. And, and uh, we sent the robots in. And we found a lot of scary, terrifying stuff, and we saved lives in Afghanistan. And then when these guys de redeployed to Iraq, they brought the robots with us. So we got down here because we had this small DARPA project. We believed in that DARPA project, and we believed that our robots could have an impact. Nobody invited us to Afghanistan. We found a way. We believed in what we did. We found a way to do it. And now we have shipped over 4,000 of these robots and have them in service today. In Iraq, when the 82nd went, uh, the challenge in Iraq were roadside bombs, vehicular-borne roadside bombs in addition. A hundred times a day, and that still goes on today to a very large degree, people were putting these booby trap devices in the streets, in the roadway, so that when American soldiers would go by, they would blow them up and kill our soldiers. When we got there, at the beginning of the conflict, there were no robots. And so 
when faced with a situation, car abandoned in the middle of the road. They decided to push it off the convoy route with this an what unarmored Humvee when it happened. Luckily, that was an up-armored Humvee. The driver was injured, but certainly was not killed, thankfully. Now compare that video to this video. There's the OD's robot going towards the uh, IED. Uh, that's the T-1000. There goes their robot. You get it on video. You I, I got it. I got that on video. Poor robot. Shit, man. <laughs> I mean, they're laughing. And it makes you feel good when you realize that, that you just went out on a limb. You said, we got to be there helping these guys. And you can turn that first video into this second video. It shows that you are having an impact and makes me so proud that this company actually followed through on the promise of trying to find better ways of doing things. We have hundreds of robots blown up in the line of duty. I don't know. They don't tell us. Every time one gets blown up, two to six people's lives have just been saved, and we get cards like this. You've saved lives Today. It's cool. It gets me up, gets me going, makes me feel like what we're doing is important and that we are, in fact, changing the world. Two more stories. Then we get to the questions. Deep Horizon. Last year, this happened. <coughs> Oil rig off the Gulf of Mexico exploded in a particularly nasty way where the blowout preventer didn't go, allowing continuous flow of millions of gallons of oil to enter the Gulf. And while we had a, um, a good response on the surface, some scientists believed that really what was going on wasn't just all the oil was coming to the surface, that these giant undersea plumes of oil, seas of oil, were being created in a dissolved fashion under the water. This is a very unpopular theory if you're the government or if you're British Petroleum in charge of trying to clean up this mess. Well, we heard this. We, took the, we got some calls from those scientists, and we said, you know, let's find out. We have a robot that, uh, called the Sea Glider that can travel for nine months underwater, diving down, carries a sensor capable of detecting underwater concentrations of oil. So we got in the car, drove, got to the Gulf of Mexico, found a dock. That's the robot, programmed it up found a boat, put it in the back of the boat, <laughs> went out to the area where the oil rigs are, and um, threw it in the water. And then we collected the data. We broadcast it up um, to the public internet so that universities could download the data, analyze the data, and we found underwater plumes of oil. And as a result, the cleanup of the Gulf grew in scope to track these plumes. And as these slowly come out of um, uh, being dissolved, we will be there to continue to ensure that we protect our environment to a much greater degree. Again, this is totally driven by some of my employees saying, we can help, let's do it. It also happens to often pay back the company in interesting ways. This one, as a result of this, hopefully we'll see some uh, future contracts. This one, which is the latest, uh, really is, is, has a fascinating after story. But the earthquake and resulting tsunami in Japan also created a horrible, horrible environmental challenge. Uh, our story, relative to Fukushima starts here. We actually, with a, uh, our distributor in Japan, had recently been uh, in Japan showing off our robots. And then the devastation that we've all seen on the TV happened. 
and we got a request from our distributor, hey, can you help? It takes about two and a half minutes to decide what the right answer is, despite the fact that taking four robots, getting them to Japan, sending people to support them was going to cost us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We could help. We did. We figured out how uh, to reassemble the robots. We had something to send. 36 hours later, they're shipped, put on a truck. My only rule was that uh, iRobot personnel did not go within 50 miles of, of the Fukushima reactor. So we arrived in Japan, saw the sites, found a conference room, set up, met with our Japanese counterparts at Tokyo Electric Power. They were fantastic. They gave us a warehouse. We created a university to rapidly train people how to uh, operate these, these robots added lots of innovative sensors and capabilities to the robots to meet the challenges and sent them in. They're the only robots currently operating in the reactors today. They're the first on site. And this is cool. This is sort of bringing it full circle back to where we started. Uh, <coughs> here's our warrior robot outfitted with a giant industrial vacuum cleaner. So this is probably, we, we run the gamut from 299 Roomba to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. But um, these robots are in, in the reactor today, cleaning up the radioactive dust, pulling out the rubble, and of course, making, slowly making that site safer so that we can continue the, clo the, the cleanup. So iRobot, as I mentioned in the beginning, has been a very interesting journey. And when I think of analogies for what my adventure has been like, I like this. Being an entrepreneur is kind of like flying an airplane while you build it. And if you're on the inside of that airplane, it kind of looks like unchanging, constant peril. But it's not. It's winning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Why don't you have a seat? <clears throat> Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have a dialogue with uh, Colin. We're going to start by uh, clarifying uh, the rules uh, of engagement. Very short questions. As a matter of fact, we already have questions that were submitted uh, via Facebook, Twitter, or the web, etc. We also are going to have questions uh, raised by the audience, and uh, I will uh, also ask uh, at some point or another, I'll inject myself and capitalize on my role and uh, steer it in one direction or another. Are, are we game for that? All right, let's okay. do it. Okay. Let's start with you. And uh, we, you have uh, all the questions uh, that were <laughs> submitted uh, on uh, the web. You know, as a rule, we want the questions to be very short and the answers to be longer. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with one question. So Matt Goodwin, assistant professor in the Bouvet College of Health Sciences, asks, besides surgical procedures and laboratory experiments, how could robotics advance and or complement health care both inside and outside of hospitals? Great question. Um, and lots of answers. I think that one of the ways that um, robots can help in hospitals is by allowing patients in underserved communities, allow rural hospitals the same access to specialization and, and uh, um, doctor specialists uh, that uh, our major city hospitals can offer. So that if you have a stroke, then there's a very short window where uh, you get evaluated, for example, uh, as to what kind of stroke. And if you have type A, you tr go down this path of treatment. If you have type B, you go down that path. If you screw up the paths, bad things happen. And robots are actually being used today to allow uh, rural hospitals to make those diagnoses using robots as telepresent surrogates for those doctors. And I think we're just seeing the beginning of this. Even more importantly, outside of hospitals, we're facing a huge demographic challenge. The number of people over the age of 65 is going to double over the next uh, decade and a half in the U.S. It's already a horrendous challenge in uh, countries like Germany and, and uh, Japan. 
And the challenge is, as you grow older at some point, you become less able to live independently. And so what typically happens is that you maybe you go into a nursing home. The problem is, the, two years ago, the annual uh, monthly cost of a nursing home was over $10,000 a month. That's a mortgage on a $2 million home. It's not economically viable as we see these numbers increase. And so that robots need to be part of the solution to allow people to live independently in the homes they're currently in, which, by the way, is what three quarters of the seniors want to do anyways. And so that robots, even robots as simple as Roomba, are part of the elder care, part of our health care solution, but we have to layer on a lot more capability in order to, to solve this. But uh, we better do it or else we're going to be facing a huge challenge. Colin, thank you. Let me ask you a question based uh, on what you just said. We have here colleagues working on a nanochip that mm -hmm. goes into the, blood, uh, the bloodstream, analyzes the tumor, and uh, starts uh, injecting targeted drugs. Mm -hmm. In all practical purposes, those are nanorobots. So mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what are you doing in terms of nanorobotics? Uh, a robot actually isn't doing anything in terms of nanorobotics other than being grateful that they exist and, and very happy that others are working on it. Uh, we do... Uh, navigation, we do remote presence, we do very, very ruggedized platforms, and, and then manipulation uh, and pull those together and then borrow shamelessly from the mobile computing industry. But um, it's an incredibly broad field, and we need all of these tools in order to continue moving forward. Let me mention something. When I was talking to Colin, he mentioned uh, that. Uh, they seeded many companies, many competitors, and the way they did it is to uh, encourage some of their uh, uh, colleagues who work for iRobots to go start companies. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that, Colin? Sure. The, um, as a company grows, your employee base is going to change. There are people who love being in the startup environment and hate being in larger companies where there's more resources slash bureaucracy. And that's a natural process, and it's one that as an entrepreneur, I like to support and encourage. Uh, I am where I am today because I started a small business. And if any of my employees came in to me and said, gee, Colin, I'm thinking of starting a new company, uh, the one thing I won't do is tell them, no, don't. It would be incredibly hypocritical of me. I'll try to make sure they understand the risks and then give them my advice and then wish them good luck if that is their hope. Why? Because the robot industry isn't defined by one company. The robot industry is defined by many, many companies. And I have a selfish reason. If they do end up succeeding, then maybe I can buy them. And that's actually how it works. You use risk capital of the venture capitalists and ideas of entrepreneurs to create businesses which either become monolithic and stay on their own or aren't quite big enough or don't quite have a big enough idea to stand on their own and are absorbed by other companies that can take that idea and turn it into something even larger and more important. And that's okay. And from my perspective, I can't afford to fund every small innovative idea Consumer companies or uh, uh, non-VC-like companies are, in general, ill-equipped to have a, uh, invest in 20 different ideas and see which one succeeds, which is the VC model. We're much happier paying the VC a premium for that one company that did actually make it. And that's how it works, and that's why the rules we have on accounting actually support and encourage entrepreneurship. Thank you, Colin. Let's take a question from the audience here. We have a microphone, otherwise we have many questions ready. Please uh, uh, also let me, uh, the, it seems to be the case that we have a computer next to a microphone and it's creating a noise. So if you can presumably, any other question? Let's go for your n next question in that case. So from one of our, from one of our Twitter followers, what was the impact of releasing a development model of the Roomba? Well, the, um, our first Roomba 
uh, I don't think we believed it was a development model at the time, um, but uh, it, was a, it was a robot designed to last 150 hours. And why 150 hours? Well, because we looked at European vacuums and they would say, well, last 150 hours. So we said, well, the Europeans, well, that's, that's high quality. We have to do what they do. And, and so we, uh, we used that as a target. I'm not sure we fully made it to that, um, that target, but that was our reliability goal. What we failed to think through fully was that if our robot was actually successful, and it was, and made vacuuming incredibly easy to do, and it did, people would use it more. And so instead of vacuuming half an hour a week is what typically you do with an upright, people were vacuuming one hour a day. <laughs> and so our first version of Roomba lasted about three to six months before you killed it. And that was a problem. <laughs> but we did one smart thing, uh, and that was to invest heavily, say, look, we've got something. This is a high-quality problem. People are using our robot. They like our robot. So we're going to double down and invest more. And regardless of the reason, if you have a problem with your robot, we'll send you a new one. So we put a lot of money into customer service. Some people went through five Roombas before we came out with a our, our, our real, our, our third generation robot um, two years later, which largely solved most of this problem. And that had an interesting effect too, because if you take a skeptic and you give them a good customer service experience, you, you, you flip them from being angry with you to happy with you. You actually create a more fanatical supporter than if the robot had just yeah. never broken in the first place. And so we were creating legions of rabid supporters by treating our customers well and got past the what could have been fatal challenge of launching a, a um, uh, less than fully mature product. We have many, many questions. In case the audience has a question, please raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Yes, over there. Yeah, yeah there is a microphone. Um, On this side, if you have a question, raise your hand. You'll get the microphone next. So before you were talking about um, helping elderly people in their homes, um, so like, what kind of future problems are you trying to solve in terms of consumer products and home use? What can we see from iRobot in the future? Well, we don't really talk about our next products, but I certainly can talk about the challenges that we see in the shorter term, right? Because there's what do you have to do in order to help someone live independently for another year, two years, many years. The further you go out, the more you get into helping that person get up, get to the bathroom, get dressed. And that's more challenging because of cost and liability reasons. Okay, we'll get there because society needs us to. But the earlier things that we can do have to do with the nightly phone call. I call my mom to see if she's okay every night, or I would. She's doing fine, but if, if, if she, as she gets older, I probably would. And um, if she doesn't answer the phone, what do I do? In my mind, she's fallen down and broken her hip and is is in trouble at the bottom of the stairs. The reality of the situation is probably across the street having tea with the neighbors. But if she doesn't answer, I need to be able to react. Well, a robot that can go out and find her would help. Medical compliance. The top reason why people go into nursing homes is failure to adhere to their medical regime. Why? Because they're incredibly complicated, one. Two, people believe that, well, I'm feeling better. I might as well stop taking my meds because if I don't take my meds, I'm not sick which is a great way of getting readmission. That's why readmission rates and chronic, chronic heart failure um, are so predictable. Every four weeks, people come out, they feel good, they stop taking their meds, they go back in. It costs billions of dollars. And so if the robot can not just beep and remind you, but bring you the pills, if you don't take the pills, escalate, go get your doctor and uh, remind you why you need to do it, that's another task. And there's a long list of things that we need to knock down. Some of the early ones, more informational, proactively intervening with information, and then you get to more physical down the road. We have a question on this. Yes. 
Um, I'm just wondering what, um, if you could give us your opinion on what the role of artificial intelligence, uh, what the role of artificial intelligence is in the future of robotics, mm -hmm. and what is iRobot doing to progress that? Okay, what is the role of artificial intelligence? Well, it's very primitive. Uh, robots are a long way from being able to even participate in a conversation around ethics or intent. This is, th these are not problems that engineers and artificial intelligence uh, uh, developers are worrying about if they're thinking about practical robots in the next few decades. Um, they're fun areas to talk about, but I don't believe that that's where the conversation should be. Where art what artificial intelligence is allowing us to do is move from a situation where we're controlling every joint on a robot and instead start giving them higher and higher level commands to more, in a more sophisticated fashion, um, capture our intent and execute a mission. So right now, a, um, uh, uh, one of our bomb disposal robots, uh, you actually, you drive it up and you, you uh, move the arm to grab the bomb to, to move it. What we'd like to do is be able to click on it and have the robot click on the bomb, go pick that up, or go point to it and have the robot understand what that means. Next, have the robot automatically driving in front of our soldiers looking for these roadside bombs automatically so that no operator is heads down looking at a screen driving the robot, which eventually takes him out of a contributory role uh, and allows them to get back in and, and uh, help the squad. So the, uh, these higher and higher levels of autonomy, you call it supervisory autonomy, are important. Uh, and then there's, of course, applications like vacuuming your home, where the robot, you hit start, and the robot pretty much does the rest. And, and I think that's, uh, we'll see increasingly sophisticated um, um, maintenance tasks where they're so um, well defined that artificial intelligence can more completely uh, complete the mission. Let me paraphrase a question that Colin <clears throat> was asked. Is yours a culture dominated by engineers? So let, let me turn to him for the, for the answer. You know, it, the, uh, when iRobot was started, we were nearly 100% engineers, uh, which I would raise my hand and say is not the ideal makeup. Uh, and I would say the fact that engineers passionately believe that they know the answer to every problem compounds that, uh, that, that challenge. And in order for iRobot to, to grow and get the success that we needed, especially on our consumer side, we needed to embrace the fact that marketing and sales and finance, these were all incredibly important functions that we needed to bring into the company, expertise that we needed to bring to the company. Probably the most dramatic exemplar of why it was important that iRobot was not truly controlled and, and driven by engineering uh, is that the name of the Roomba as chosen by our internal engineers was the cyber suck. <laughs> <laughs> With dust puppy coming in a, a close second. So luckily sitting where I was, there, I said, you know, that's, I'm not sure, but that's probably a really bad idea. <laughs> and, we, you know, we, all, we ultimately outsourced the, um, the naming of, of the robot. We also, uh, after our first example of um, building a TV commercial, which completely didn't succeed, um, brought in more creative talent to uh, create messaging that would appeal not just to us as engineers, but to the rest of, of the population as well. And, and that had an uh, incredibly uh, dramatic effect on sales. And um, uh, again, we learned lessons slow and hard, but we did, in fact, learn them. And, and uh, you can now be a, a marketing person at, at iRobot, not just a marketing weenie, which <laughs> was the prior uh, uh, 
moniker if you, if you dared admit to the fact that you it. like this stuff. I got it. Now, we have a question over there, a brief question also. Hey. Um, so you had almost 10 years, over 10 years, of very minimal revenue and failures. How did you decide to stay an entrepreneur, continue with the idea, and also how did you deal with investors during that time? Well, the um, first off, we didn't warrant investors. We were completely unfundable, and we were um, uh, we survived by getting paid a half up front to go create robots for the research community, and creating strategic partnerships with multinationals who were interested in our research. It wasn't until 1998 that we had matured sufficiently as a company that we could go and make a legitimate VC pitch. I think that many entrepreneurs rush too quickly to the VC community with um, plans that are less fully baked uh, than, than really they, uh, they ought to be. Now, question of, well, that's fine to say, Colin, but we have to eat. Mm -hmm. and so sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you can find angels. Sometimes you can do what we did, which is find partners, large, uh, larger companies that are interested in your technology and would be willing to bankroll you to some degree. And then the, uh, the US government with the SBIR program for small business is also yeah. uh, an incredibly important uh, way of getting early funding. Yes. Um, one of my board members, when I was explaining to him with great passion about what my revenue was going to be to the, to the nearest dollar, you know, make $7,528. You know, he stopped me and said, Colin, you're either lucky or wrong on this. Let's move on. You yeah. know, I, I think that it's more important to spend time on what is the business, how are you going to, um, what, where are we going to invest money in, in creating products than uh, focusing on boiling the ocean around what's going to happen in two years. We have a question here. Thank you, by the way, for coming to speak to us. My pleasure. Um, so I had a question for you about leadership. Mm -hmm. It's kind of building on the second to last question. And it, it really comes down because in your talk, you talked a lot about winning, right? So, and you've got a very big vision, one that you can't obviously do all by yourself. So you have to pick leaders to help you do it. And I was wondering how you identify those leaders, both within the company and outside, both early on when you were kind of dealing with your friends and then later on when it was a bigger company? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, the key is to recognize and be very honest with each other. Um, you know, you start a company with people that either you're friends or become your friends very quickly because you're in such a pressure cooker of an environment. Absolutely. And invariably things change, the environment changes. A person who was wildly qualified to be a three-person stage startup head of marketing is wildly unqualified to be the, have that same role, perhaps at 50 people or 100 people. And I think that there are hard conversations that have to happen uh, as the company begins to succeed. Either that person needs to really dedicate himself or herself to becoming the next level of, of, of competence in that particular arena, or they need to decide that they like startups and should go do another startup, which is cool too. What is bad for you, for your investors, for your other employees, is to sort of do the hear no evil, see no evil uh, uh, routine and, and just think that it's going to be okay because it never is. So uh, what I have done with um, my internal people, you've you got to challenge them and say, look, I, for an example, my GC, uh, great guy, prior to the IPO, we had a talk. He said, you know, you've never been a public company GC. It's an incredibly different job. What are you going to do to learn how to be a public company GC? Because... Frankly, we have to decide what we're going to do. General, General counsel. counsel. General counsel. And he said, I'm not going to lie, Colin. I want the job. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm joining a, G, a public company GC group. Um, I've got peers. I've got this. I've got that. I won't let you down. And he didn't. And he's my GC. 
He's fantastic, and he made the jump. Many, many other people at iRobot didn't. And they're happier in reality for leaving the company and doing something else than feeling yes. like they're losing. They just needed to, that tough conversation to, let's be real, you're more of a small company. The job is very different. It, it contains stuff that you don't wake up in the morning wanting to do. And so that, why don't we change this? Now, the second part of your question I want to get to as well because it's, um, I think, equally important. There are many, many things that a company, as it scales, must learn to do that it never had to face before. And so you need to look into yourself in, and say, uh, it's okay we don't know anything about reverse logistics. We never had anything to sell before. So we need to go bring somebody in from the outside who is an expert at reverse logistics. Same thing with IT, same thing with human resources, uh, same thing with all sorts of more sophisticated um, specialized disciplines in engineering that suddenly became important. And also in leadership. I think many companies have CEO changes. Um, ours didn't because I raised my hand and said, I really want to do this. And I'm, uh, if you don't think I'm gonna, doing a good job, throw me out, that's okay, but give me a chance. But with, throughout the, the company, we did manage to attract other fantastic people. And it was the mission. Right? The, uh, the guy who runs my COO now, but the guy I brought in to run my, my uh, government industrial division was the top recruited retiring flag officer from the US, arm, US military. He's a three-star admiral. When I was negotiating with him, he said, I need a day off a month because I'm chairing the NASA commission on the return to flight for the space shuttle. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and, he, and, and it was, Joe, why, why are you here? He's like, well, because I want to build cool stuff. I want to have fun, deliver a great product, and change the world. And that's why I came. Same thing for my uh, first president of the, of the home robot division. Same thing for many of the people in the company. We had a culture and a mission that excited really amazing people. And we used recruiters, because what did we know about HR? So we had a lot of coaching to help us find people who were truly qualified. And um, you know, even with recruiters, your hit rate is probably around 60% if you're lucky. So uh, keep that in mind as you bring new people into the company. You, you're going to have to fire half of them. But if you are honest with yourself and have good communication, you do end up with a, a team to take you to the next level. Chris, let's go for another question from the web. Yep, another question from the web. Um, you may have heard of Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, questioning the value of higher education and offering $100,000 for college students to drop out and innovate. You have two degrees from MIT. Do you think that you could have been as successful and as much of an innovator without this education? And this wasn't planted by Peter Thiel. <laughs> you know, I, I have... No. No, that's the answer. No, okay. that's not. Then it gives us time for another question. <laughs> In that case, I see that you're uh, already there. Do you want to add something to that, to this answer? Uh, please, Colin, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I, I look at my um, time uh, at MIT and, and between the classwork, but also the mentoring I got from working with the professors it was a crucible of learning, a crucible of gaining experience that prepared me to do what I tried to do. And, and so that um, drop out and there's not a hurry. I mean, I, 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 you, the, there are more lessons that I could have learned at MIT which would have greatly compressed my uh, time to first pixel of revenue. I might have been better off staying there a little longer. Um, but, uh, you know, education, learning the tools, this isn't voodoo magic, mm -hmm. right? The, the, uh, yeah. the skills that you learn to create companies and scale them are learnable skills. The people that you meet and interact with in school also can have a, a profound impact 
I'll tell one, one more story. Um, I went to a, uh, stayed at a fraternity uh, at MIT called Alpha Delta Phi. I was a, I'm, a, I'm a brother there, so yeah, I think that's yeah. what you're supposed to say. In, in my, uh, at Alpha <laughs> Delta Phi, you had, <coughs> while I was there, a guy named Brad Feld, who is the, one of the most respected VCs in the country today. You had a guy named Jeet, Ching, Jeet, uh, Jeet Singh and Joe Chung, the founders of Art Technology Group. Uh, a guy named Arana Gozi, the founder of Harmonix, maker of rock band and, and uh, guitar hero. Uh, Carl Dietrich, the uh, founder of Terrafugia. Uh, Jim Bellingham, the, the founder of Bluefin Robotics, an underwater uh, robot company. And all of this one fraternity. Why did it happen? Well, because if Feld could start a company, <laughs> why the heck couldn't I? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of, you know, bring people together, have them teach each other, and, and dispel the illusion that what we do is somehow unaccessible and, and, and strange. Instead, uh, making it real. And those, those are experiences that I could only have had in uh, the university setting, and I'm, I'm very happy that I, I was, did not take anybody's big check to go drop out. That w then I'd have a big check and yep. uh, spent it on beer or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Colin, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, back to the early years and early failures. What were some of the challenges in marketing and distribution? How did you overcome those? Marketing and distribution challenges. Well, the... Um, uh, Finding anyone that would uh, take the Roomba was my, was my first challenge. Uh, the um, Sharper Image said they were going to do it, and then they, they backed out. Um, I was trying to get Brookstone to, to carry the product, and they, would, you know, they wouldn't return our calls and so forth. The only way we got into Brookstone was we found someone who was the assistant buyer for the smallest catalog they made, the hard to find tools catalog, who had been on the job for one day and didn't yet know that she's supposed to hang up on me. <laughs> so, so we got into there and um, <laughs> demoed to her and she said, oh my God, and got her boss, who said, oh my God, got his boss. And, and within 45 minutes, we were up to the, the uh, president of, of, of Brookstone and, and we were off and running. And so that was just bullheaded running at the brick wall trying to figure out how to make it happen. Our next challenge was the fact that lots of people wanted to carry our product. And we only had one product. So we had the silver Roomba being sold at, at, at uh, Brookstone and Target at the same time, which was not a sustainable thing. And that would have crashed and, and destroyed our price and, and, and caused a huge challenge, if not for this marketing guy that I'd hired who said, you know what you got to do, Colin? Paint them different colors. Yeah. <laughs> so in the second year, we had three different colors of Roombos, the same robot underneath. Uh, we added one button to our high-end model that uh, said max. And that just, you used to tell it small, medium, or large room size. Max just turned it on until the battery died. But, <laughs> you know, that, and we, we, so we added a couple more filters into the higher end boxes and had a $50 price point difference between low end and high end and we started to create different SKUs to support different, channel, um, different channels. But we were, we were actually very lucky in that we had these inbound calls because our product was new and so as a buyer you tend to be comped or uh, compensated based on same store sales improvements. And we were new, and so if you had 10 vacuum cleaners, normally you would take your low-performing vacuum cleaner and p replace it with a, a different vacuum cleaner. They could get rid of one of their lower-performing vacuum cleaners and, and replace it with Roomba, which would be incremental sales because people would buy Roomba and the, the normal vacuum cleaner and make a lot more money, get paid more, make more bonus, and, uh, and so that it was a whirlwind of activity where people wanted our product because of how we had positioned it. So we were lucky on that front. Colin, uh, you, you come to or you came to embody the values and uh, the creativity and the mission of iRobots. And uh, when I thanked you for uh, 
having uh, uh, over 90 co-op students over uh, the life of, the, uh, of your company so far. You to and uh, you told me it's a win-win situation. Absolutely. We have many students looking, uh, you know, looking at you. We have many students listening to you over the web. And they are in other uh, also auditoria and on campus listening to you. Why is it a win-win? It's a win-win because the creative energy and enthusiasm that we get from our interns is infectious. We have taken ideas from interns, incorporated them into our products. We've gotten tremendous value out of the work that they have put into uh, testing uh, and improving our products. And, and, so, and, and we're able to also use it as a way of saying, who truly has the passion for robots? And uh, if we can hire an intern and they impress us, then we can say, okay, we want to hire you. And as they go through their completion of their studies, we can have uh, many conversations to make it clear that iRobot would be interested in giving them employment once they're, uh, once they're done and once they're graduated. So it is a great opportunity. It's something that every year we probably have uh, over 50 interns at the company. It seems like it's a, uh, a business that can put interns to good work doing things other than copying things. We, 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 uh, uh, we love, we've sent interns to, uh, to Egypt to go run robots in the Great Pyramid. That was a good intern for, for, who, for those two yeah. guys. And, uh, and then working on our, our real product. So it, it works for us. Um, uh, I'm glad that it works for Northeastern and, and we look forward to continuing and growing the Thank program. You. Thank you. And we have now co-op and experiential education all in 85 countries. So we would love to uh, have you send, uh, give this opportunity to the students all over the world. Colin. Your creative energy is also infectious, so thank you for being with us today. Let me invite you all to uh, a reception, and you'll be able to mingle uh, with uh, Colin. And those of you who haven't been able to ask your questions, that's an opportunity to ask a very quick questions, and let's give precedence to the students. If you want to ask your questions, Colin would be outside, but let him have a drink at least. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were terrific. Thank you. We also, the, the second uh, speaker uh, in the series is uh, going to be with us on December 1st, so we'll see you uh, then. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.